my fantastic pleasure to welcome you all here to celebrate uh, the third anniversary of the Women's uh, Network Forum. So good morning. May I take this opportunity to thank Donald and the London Stock Exchange for hosting us all today. We are indeed hugely honoured to be here to celebrate the opening of the market this morning. Next year, it will be 100 years since women in the UK began to win the right to vote. But it wasn't for another decade that the law changed to include all women over the age of 21. 55 years later, in 1973, the London Stock Exchange admitted its first six women members. A further 24 years later, Marjorie Scardino became the first female chief executive of a FTSE 100 company when she was appointed CEO of Pearson in 1997. And Clara Furse became the first female CEO of the London Stock Exchange in 2001. The Duke of Edinburgh's award, Women's Network Forum, applauds the commitment the LSE has made to diversity and the progression of women. We appreciate the transparency with which you are pursuing your goals, including, as mentioned, establishing your women's inspired network and being one of the early signatories to Her Majesty's Treasury's Women in Finance Charter. We are all cheering you on and thank you once again for hosting us all here today. However, while we can highlight various success stories and progress in achieving gender parity, it's remaining slow. And unfortunately, just because lots of companies have gender equality on their agendas, many people have been lulled into a job done mentality. The Women's Network Forum has brought together senior leadership from a group of committed companies to share best practices and support each other in their diversity agendas with particular emphasis on promoting gender equality in the corporate world. Through our work over the past three years, it has become apparent to us all that we are actually still only at the start of the journey. Those charged with, with pushing forward the agenda equality programs in many companies find achieving their objectives frustratingly difficult. Yes, there have been some wins along the way, for instance, there are now seven FTSE 100 CEOs who are women, compared to three in 2013. And since the 30% club launched in the UK in 2010, with a goal of achieving a minimum of 30% women on FTSE 100 boards, the figures stand at 26%, up from 12.5% when it began. Also, the pipeline of the next generation of female talent in companies is building. However, <coughs> When the World Economic Forum published its 11th annual Global Gender Report last autumn, what became clear is that whilst some areas are doing well to address the gender-based disparities, there are others that are trailing behind. In particular, gaps in economic participation and political empowerment remain wide. Globally, only 59% of the economic participation gap has been closed, which is down from a peak in 2013 and has fallen back to the level of 2008. For political empowerment, the gap is worse, with only 23% of the gap being closed, although slight progress is being made year on year. Looking at current trends, it is believed that it will take 83 years to close the overall gender gap for the 107 countries which have been analyzed since the inception of the report. This is just within the statistical lifetime of baby girls born today. For the economic participation part of the study, it will still take 170 years to close the gap. So far from being job done, the message is clear. We are not done. And apathy now could potentially be our biggest enemy. So I implore you all to redouble your efforts and make a step change in how your businesses are structured. You all know the statistics behind the business case, but just to remind you, and as Don has mentioned as well, recent figures published in the 2016 PwC Women in Work Index suggest that economic gender parity could add an additional US dollars 240 billion 
to the GDP of the United Kingdom alone and over one trillion US dollars to the United States. Women are the dominant consumer base, representing 70 to 80% of consumer spending through buying or influence. That's nearly $20 trillion globally. Studies have cited that organizations with inclusive cultures have greater innovation, creativity, and bottom line results. Equality means opportunity, which breeds success. I applaud each of you for what you have done already, but would encourage all of you to do much more to engage both men and women in helping to build your pipelines of young talent, to be transparent about your aims and status, to measure your progress, and to create a new energy and importantly, say no to apathy. There is a quote that says, behind every great man stands no woman. There is no greater man than the man that can acknowledge the woman standing right next to him. Now talking of great men, it's my enormous pleasure to introduce our special guest speaker this morning. Paul Pullman has been Chief Executive Officer of Unilever since January 2009. Under his leadership, Unilever has set out an ambitious vision to decouple growth from its environmental footprint while increasing its positive social impact. Paul is chairman of the World Business Council for Sustainable Development, a member of the B Team, the UN SDG Advocacy Group, and serves on the board of the UN Global Compact. In 2016, he received France's Chevalier de la Légion d'Honneur in recognition of his efforts in galvanizing sustainable business and for his involvement in the 2015 UN Climate Change Conference in Paris. Paul is also a champion of women. Since Unilever undertook its comprehensive gender diversity program in 2009, they have seen impressive improvements in gender balance at the board, senior and middle management levels and consistent improvements of male to female ratios across the company. He does not recognize the word apathy. Please join me in welcoming Paul Pullman to speak about the power of equality. Your Royal Highness, uh, thanks for the opportunity, uh, Lady, Lady uh, Mayoress, uh, friends and family, because uh, my wife is here, so it's the family part, <laughs> and uh, some friends here as well in the audience. Thanks for this opportunity, and uh, Donald, thanks for opening up your, your place to make this uh, important event possible. Um, the uh, slogan I noticed was, uh, your word is your bond in the London Stock Exchange. So as it comes to your commitment to diversity, I hope your word is your bond and you will achieve your challenging targets of 40% by 2020. Uh, I think a lot of the people here will obviously be watching. Uh, the good thing is that uh, lots of progress has been made and your women's uh, uh, network forum that you've started is again another example. I think of the type of initiatives that we need to uh, move things forward. Everybody is clear on the direction. It's like with climate change or with the sustainable development goals. Often the direction is not something we debate, but it's the speed with which we're going that makes us a little bit impatient. And um, the, um, it was um, a Benjamin Franklin uh, who said, you may delay, but time will not, and lost time will never be found again. And I think we're just wasting our time with a lot of these issues. I think the main... Uh, thing that we need to do is uh, human willpower. You know, we have uh, all the programs in place. Uh, we know what we have to do. We have all the data, as you've heard before. I won't even re will not repeat them. But at the end of the day, it's uh, human willpower that is missing in many of these human development issues. And I see women uh, gender uh, equality as a as a as a development issue, as a human development issue. In that sense, I'll talk about the sustainable development goals because it fits squarely into that. And uh, we need more of that human willpower, which, by the way, the reason I like it is it is a renewable resource. <laughs> the, uh, we've, um, we've worked this a lot in, in our company. Uh, I don't want to bother you with uh, statistics, but we now have about 47% of our managers are female, and that is up about from 37% when I came uh, eight or nine years ago. Uh, half of our board is female, in fact, slightly over half. And then if, then if you say, yeah, but what about senior management? So our most senior management in the company, which is the people reporting to me, is uh, over 30% are women there as well. So we, we do all the things that uh, you know about. We set uh, the targets. We hold people accountable. 
We create the right internal programs. We're very happy with our agile working environment program, the maternity and paternity programs, the mentoring programs, the training programs, the, uh, the different uh, uh, efforts that we have in addressing the unconscious biasness, because often all these programs are in place, but it's the behavior that gets in the way, and how do you help people get over that? And then we have obviously, like uh, many of you will have, a global diversity board, which I chair myself, and uh, although we actually don't run the company with quotas, uh, nor do we link it to compensation, because I don't think that this should be rewarded, actually. Uh, the people that don't deliver should be worked out of the company. It's as simple as that. And that's why we believe it's probably not better to link it to positive reinforcement, but to take care of the people that still don't get it. We really don't want to have them in our company. And uh, you see a, a race to the top uh, happening quite uh, quickly if you put your word where your mouth is. I think some people know what I'm referring to. But at the end of the day, uh, we're also, uh, we continue to have the mindset that we're at the beginning of our journey. The, um, although we have gender parity, and in fact, in many of our subsidiaries, uh, you go, interestingly, the issue is Europe and to some extent the US. Uh, so where you're living is very unfortunate. But like in Russia, we have 75% uh, women. We actually have to work very hard to get the men in. Uh, and the same you see in China or many of the other countries. In fact, the former communist countries actually are very gender diverse, believe it or not. Um, but we also, also have some challenges. Uh, engineering is still an issue. So supply chain, sales are departments that, although we are basically gender balanced in the organization, are departments that are a little bit behind. So we will continue with the same figure. Uh, my goal is to have, uh, we have about 500 factories in the world, a little bit more than that, and that at least half of them are operated by women. And actually, interestingly, when that is the case, you have better community relationships, the, the uh, factories are better run, I believe, so, so it does make uh, sense for all of us. The um, statistics are there. In fact, McKinsey says that uh, companies that have the highest number of women on boards uh, would have a 41% higher return on equity and a 58% better operating results. So be it for talent development, for culture, or for innovation, uh, for leadership, for performance, it just makes sense. And that's why I wonder why we are making so little progress. Because if people don't see this enormous force you can create by giving everybody an opportunity by participating in a 100% talent pool and all the other things that come with it, how are they managing all the other things in their businesses? Uh, this is just a little bit of a symptom, I think, of, of, uh, of uh, how people or some people think. And um, for that reason, I'd be very careful to invest in companies that actually don't see these statistics significantly improve, because I think there are underlying issues that you ought to be worried about, and people need to pay more attention to it. And I'm actually glad to see that, like on the London Stock Exchange or many of the other exchanges, some of these other data, the ESG data, environmental, social, and governance, as people say, are increasingly uh, coming in. But there's good news, as I may start first before I go into some of the opportunities. If you look at um, lots of the studies we've done with the UN, it is very clear that there, that there is absolute progress. It's actually the best time to be born. People live longer, more people have access to education, to medical care, maternal health is better, more people have water or sanitation. It's a great time to be born. And the same thing, it's a great time to be a woman. In fact, more women are going to school now as well. They're likely to get into higher education. As we all know, when they get into higher education, they tend to do better than us. Um, and uh, more women are actively participating in the workforce and getting leading positions. So although we know that, uh, that we have still a uh, distant dream to get this parity, there is progress, and that's why we need to rejoice and look at where these pockets of progress are um, and, and uh, build on them. But it's also very clear that uh, despite half of the world population being women, uh, it only accounts for about 37% of the GDP. And in fact, if you look at uh, the world's work that is being done, uh, believe it or not, uh, women do about 65% of the world's work, but only have about 10% of the world's income. And that is even worse if you go into some parts of the world and then look at some of the activities like Africa, agriculture or something. It is also, if you look at all the statistics of human development, women have the wrong end of the stick. 
70% of the women actually live in poverty. And as His Royal Highness was saying, it takes us 170 years, according to the WEF gender report, to, to reach that um, parity. I certainly don't want to uh, wait for that. But also, if you look at other statistics, one in three women suffers from violence. There are over 600 million women that, in this world that are actually married before the age of 15 and that are currently living in the world. If you look at the issues of refugees or slave labor, you find a disproportionate amount. If you look at all the sustainable development goals, the people that go to bed hungry, the people that are excluded from access to legal systems or education, you have women, unfortunately, disproportionately uh, represented there. So there's a job to be done. Now, the issue, as I said, is actually even more so in these parts of the world. Only 4% of the, uh, the, the, the top uh, Fortune 500 uh, CEOs are actually women, which is an abysmally low number. 16% uh, uh, women on boards, on efforts, which is, again, something that is fairly low. And even if you look in politics, uh, it's about 20% of our politicians are women. Uh, as many of you would, would attest to, uh, the situations would be slightly better if these numbers would be a little bit higher because we sure have an ability to make a mess of it. Um, it's interesting that uh, I was just reading yesterday the Financial Times flying back to uh, London, and 85% uh, of the debate on Brexit, and I don't want to start here a Brexit discussion, <laughs> although many people know what side of the equation I'm on, but 85% of the discussions on television was Brexit, where, had, where men discussing. Only 15% of the discussions were done by women. I could not you know, prevent myself from thinking, uh, reading this, uh, what would the outcome, what would the outcome have been if we would have had a little bit more balanced discussion, at least around gender. Now, we, um, at the UN, in 2015, we made a big decision as combined uh, nations of this world, about 193 countries in this world, signed a declaration in September 2015, which, was, uh, which is the Sustainable Development Goals. I proudly wear the pin of the 17 goals here, which really deal with uh, irreversibly eradicating poverty and doing that in a more sustainable and equitable way. It's a plan about people. It's a plan about our planet. It's a plan about peace, more needed now than ever. A plan about prosperity, but above all, partnership. Partnership for the common good. Thinking about ourselves, our communities, but more importantly, intergenerational. And you look at all of these goals, these famous 17 goals and 169 targets, actually, of the Sustainable Development Goals, and you see that the issue of women, as I mentioned before, runs through all of that. Obviously, we called out a separate goal, which is goal number five, which is about gender equality. And that's obviously where we are going to focus on now, giving women the same access to education or land rights or finance and all the other things that come with it will have probably the biggest effect on uh, reaching the goals. In fact, with uh, work that we've done recently to look at each of the goals, at a time that we cannot get economic growth, at a time that we cannot get decent job creation, just getting these same opportunities out there would unlock the global economy actually by $28 trillion. It's one of our biggest opportunities to move the 100 trillion economy forward by an incremental $28 trillion. And the investments we need to put behind it are actually meager. If you think now that the way we're running this world, which is a great world, but the way we're running this is absolutely bizarre. We destroy about 3% of our global GDP every year in the destruction of biodiversity. Climate change is already costing us 5% of global GDP. And then preventing conflicts or the cost of war is 9% of global GDP. And to make these sustainable development goals come to life is only 3 to 4% of GDP. We have here an equation of an investment of 3 to 4%, whilst the cost that we're spending to deal with the consequences of not acting is already significantly higher. I think until that moment that we catch on to that and start to think about a little bit more common sense in the way we run this world, we don't deserve the rights to call ourselves the most intelligent species as far as I'm concerned. Now, the um, investments are not only in the uh, monetary terms, but they also have a lot of trickle-down effects. We find very clearly in our value chain that if we invest in women, 
significantly more money, 80, 90 percent of that money, actually ends up with their families, with nutrition, with education. With men, unfortunately, especially in the developing world, that's about 30 to 40 percent. Also, if you can take the child labor out of your value chain, and we all know how difficult that is, you provide a child for every year more in school is 15 to 20 percent. <coughs> you increase their income potential and obviously their chances to a better life. Now, our ambitions go way back. I don't have to talk about it too much in Unilever, but it was interesting when uh, Lord Lever, later be known as Leverholm, uh, started the company in the um, uh, 19th century. Uh, he already had that vision from day one. In fact, when he became member of the House of Lords, uh, he took the name, his name of his wife. His wife was... Uh, Home was her last name, and he became Lord Lever Home, which kind, was kind of unusual. If you go back in the history of those days, taking the name of your wife was simply not done in Victorian Britain for some reason. And then he introduced pensions, equal rights. Uh, when World War I came, he guaranteed the women not only the jobs if they wanted to work, but certainly the income of the men. So not surprisingly, we had the highest number of volunteers there. And as I said, he introduced pensions in the UK because he felt that was very important for um, providing that balanced life that often was deprived again to more females than, than males. And if you have a chance to go to the Wirral, uh, visit the Lady Lever Home Museum because uh, the Lady Lever Gallery is one of the finest museums uh, in that region. And again, he dedicated it to his wife. So the man knew what needed to be done and uh, many of his writings are about this, this uh, basic human <coughs> right, this respect and dignity for everybody. And um, uh, he called it at those, in those days uh, shared prosperity, which he believed in from a way of running our business. And we still try to do that uh, in the way we run our business today, getting out of the red race of quarterly reporting or shareholder primacy and focusing on the stakeholders that we need to serve. Knowing very well, but by focusing on these stakeholders and serving them well, ultimately, our shareholders will do well as well. But that is certainly not the purpose of our business. What I'm excited about, if you want to tackle diversity, you can open any book or join any network and find any of these best practices. But at the end of the day, the commitment starts at the top and you have to walk the talk. And it's very simple and that's an everyday test and sometimes we fail that, but hopefully most of the time we succeed. What I'm most excited about in Unilever is we don't see this as an, as an activity that is only an office activity. I think that's one of the reasons why we make so little progress. We think that in all of it we do, we need to take a gender diversity lens. Uh, many companies with CSR look at things that are only under their control, their offices, their travel, their factories. We take a responsibility of the total value chain. We've made a commitment to decouple growth from an environmental impact and increase overall social impact. Part of our target of increasing social uh, impact uh, is to create livelihoods for five million women in our value chain. And anything we do in our value chain has a gender lens. We don't think that by outsourcing your value chain, you can outsource your responsibility. That is not something that we would um, subscribe to. Interestingly, in farming itself, and most of the poor people in this world are actually subsistent farmers. They're monocrop farmers, so they also have issues with stunting, still 160 million children born every year, not getting enough nutrition, scarred for the rest of their lives. First thousand days, crucial. And most of the people that go to bed hungry, still 800 million people going to bed hungry, not even knowing if they will wake up the next day, are actually women and subsistence farmers. So interestingly, 50% or over 50% of our world population are farmers. And in our system, we try to especially focus on that group to lift them up and obviously give them a better life that they all deserve. We work in our value chain with most of our suppliers with our responsible sourcing code with a gender lens. For example, with Simrise, we have a program on livelihoods in Vanilla in Madagascar where we have uh, 10,000 women, smallholder farmers, and be sure that their children go to school. The reason we do these programs is we ideally like to take one of our suppliers. We like to take governments to bring in funding because it's not that easy. Things like DIVID or USAID. And then we work with NGOs. In this case, on the vanilla, for example, uh, we work with Save the Children. We have equal programs with MasterCard uh, on financial inclusion, absolutely key. We want our whole value chain to be financial inclusion. Take, for example, our two biggest tea plantations that we have in Caricio 
and Mufindi, which is in Kenya and Tanzania, where we have about uh, 150,000 uh, families living there. So these are like cities. Uh, we want to be sure that all the women that are there uh, have financial inclusion and get paid automatically and, and not have to deal with the money and the consequences of money. Now, interestingly, Kenya is a country where one out of three women get raped. And when they go to the police, most likely the chances are high that the police will rape them again because they've been raped anyway. So this is a very sad situation. And you can imagine that even on tea plantations, we deal with a lot of sexual harassment, either directly or indirectly. It's very easy to assign people to very productive fields if in the after hours the favors are returned. We moved a few years ago to 50% of our supervisors being women. People said that cannot be done. I said, then we're going to close the tea plantations. All of a sudden, it can be done, because the alternative of closing the tea plantation is a little bit more drastic. So find something that seems to be worse for people that otherwise can't make up their mind. So we made uh, our tea plantations 50% women. And not surprisingly, the issues that we have to deal with, obviously still enormous programs with social workers and all the other things, but the issues that we have to deal with went from here to, to next to zero. We also look at it in our value chain in terms of providing employment. Uh, Shakti program in uh, India is a great example. Shakti uh, st means strengths, and we have uh, India 70% rural. We have 75,000 women working for us, literally going in the rural uh, villages. We provide them the products, the microcredit if you want to, and they get their livelihoods by selling. And it makes good business sense for us as well. We sell to two and a half billion people a day, and we're in about seven out of 10 households. So when you do that, you have an enormous opportunity to change people and to change people's behaviors and to change people's mindsets. Sometimes we do that by simply teaching them how to brush teeth and all that stuff. But more importantly, you can also do that by attacking the issues of gender equality. And one of the most powerful things actually to leverage when you are a company like ours, made of wonderful brands, are the brands themselves. So all of our brands, we want to have a gender diversity lens in there as well. You're well familiar with Dove, with women's self-esteem, but only 4% of women in this world feel very comfortable with the bodies that they're in, but to the extent that they might not raise their hands in school to not draw attention or not participate in swimming classes or other activities. So we've started the Dove self-esteem programs. You're well familiar with that and we're reaching uh, you know, 20 million girls a year easily on these programs and obviously expanding that. Brands like Pons have started partnering with Vital Voices, giving women that are aspirational or role models for others a public voice. Uh, Sunsilk, uh, training entrepreneurs in uh, countries like India, the beauty saloons, etc. One of the brands we bought two years ago is called Dermalogica. One of the reasons we bought that brand, I was very interested in that, is that Jane Worland, who was probably one of the biggest champions for gender equality, created this program of financial independence through entrepreneurship. And she trains about 100,000 women entrepreneurs. I had the pleasure to be there once, and it's just enormous. You also have to use your brands to lighten their loads. That's very simple. Everything we do, because 85% of our products are being bought by women and, frankly, being used by women. I'm actually surprised that we had to fight so hard in our own company to get more or less the gender balance in the first place. In fact, we should have 80% women, to be honest, because that's the ones we serve. But if we look at all of our brands from a female angle once more, you also see incredible insights. We just launched Sunlight in Africa. Water is a tremendous issue. We call it the 25th hour. 200 million hours are lost every year by just fetching water back and forth. And uh, it's obviously the women that do this. So if you can take away that uh, task, so we put in sunlight water centers. But more importantly, we invented a product that has enormous suds when you do your hand washing, because women like suds. It's a, it's a sort of a cue that the product is performing. But then when you rinse, you want to get rid of these suds right away. So it's quite a technology. Lots of suds, but instead of rinsing three <laughs> times, you want zero suds. So we came out with this product like sunlight, with, uh, with these collapsing suds, and it's doing very well. But the reason we started these products is because we understand, uh, understood, in this case, the chores that women had to go through. So get it through 
in all of your brands. Now, the most important challenge is what I referred to before. It is the perceptions, the negative perceptions that people have. There are some incredibly harmful social norms or stereotyping that have crept into our society. Uh, we have a perception of the relative possibilities or perceived value of girls relative to boys. We have a perception of what is the appropriate work for boys or girls. Or we think that women should be burdened with a disproportionate amount of household chores or normalize the idea that men should have choices in many cultures over, should have uh, rights over women's choices. So all these perceptions that have crept in, with which we've all been brought up, myself included, need to be challenged. And one of the things that we're excited about is that we use all of our brands to start an action which is called unstereotyping. Having said, reaching 2.5 billion consumers a day, that's an enormous force that you can use to change these social norms. Now, advertising <laughs> undoubtedly has failed to keep up with uh, gender. Like I believe, advertising has failed to keep up with the sustainability movement. Often people tell me consumers don't get it. It's not true at all. I think our advertising community, and some of them are in the room here, so they'll, they'll take note as I talk, but we have just lost our self-touch. And the same thing in advertising itself. If you look at uh, half of the women uh, used in uh, magazine advertising are sexualized. Women are rarely presented in our communication or advertising as having authority. Uh, what we would call the experts in lab coats or something. Only 3% of advertising features women in managerial or professional roles. And women feature, not surprisingly, disproportionately in domestic scenes and mainly uh, in the service of product news. Only 20% actually of voiceovers feature women voices. So there's an enormous opportunity in the way we communicate behind our brands to and stereotype. And Interestingly, when and where we do this, and credit to Alina, who has been the driving force behind that in our company, we actually see better business results. Again, surprising that uh, it doesn't happen quicker. When we launched our unstereotype campaign, we got about 1.3 billion uh, media impressions. And now we're moving this beyond that to address this unstereotyping in the workplace, which I said is, again, a bigger issue, even in our company. 77% of men and 55% of women believe that men should be giving highest stake projects. 60% of women and 49% of men reported that stereotypes impact their careers, their personal lives or both. So there's an enormous work to do in that sense and I think it's uh, probably more so in many of the other countries. Now, under the uh, Unilever Sustainable Living Plan, where we simply say it's a long-term plan for us. We don't think that we can attack all these issues, these development issues of food security or hunger or education, access to water or sanitation, that by quarterly minopsis. They need longer-term plans. It's one of the reasons why we abolished quarterly reporting. It's one of the reasons why we stopped giving guidance. We wanted to be sure that our people understood that they could work uh, for the longer term. But I think that the skills and qualities of the leaders that we need in today's world to drive these more purpose-driven business models are better rested in the female gender than in the male gender. That's why you're very well placed. There was a book that came out about two years ago from Hannah Rosen, which is called The End of the Era of Men. I have to say it even scared me. <laughs> um, I'm not so sure that we are at the end of the era of men, but as we put more responsible socially and environmentally responsible business models, more inclusive business models out there, which are absolutely needed to make this world function. I think it's very, you're very well placed as a female gender, I think, to attack it, because it's exactly the qualities that we need that you have that are probably in more demand than ever moving forward. Qualities like authentic leadership, qualities like having a deeper sense of purpose, qualities like being better in working collaboratively, partnerships being coming increasingly more important. And I would say also having a much longer term focus than many of your male colleagues will have. It's not surprising then, if you talk to people like uh, Peter Sens from MIT, 
that um, he actually did a study on 10 or 15 of the world's biggest humanitarian <laughs> efforts that are going on. And not surprisingly, you find the bulk of those being managed by women. We got the COP21 climate change agreements through the wonderful women like Christiana Vigueras. We got the sustainable development goals through the efforts of wonderful women like Amina Mohamed. We have Helen Clark, who just stepped down now, but was leading the UNDP. And the list goes on. You don't even have to go to the Mother Teresa's of this world. But many of these humanitarian efforts that the world, thank God, has benefited from at a time that it seems like we cannot agree on anything are actually the ones that are uh, led by women. Now, the good thing is here that I think more and more businesses are starting to uh, understand the importance of gender parity. And there are some wonderful businesses that are being involved here. Uh, Photophone has great programs. I'm on the board of UN Women with uh, the man who runs <laughs> Tupperware, uh, Twitter. Uh, many of these companies have signed up for the He For She campaign. I don't know if you're familiar with that, but we need one billion uh, men to pledge their support. Many have signed up to the women empowerment principles that the UN has uh, put out, very important to ensure that your companies are part of this um, uh, advocacy, if you want to. And then, obviously, uh, work in partnerships. Be sure that your CEO doesn't just put the programs out there and blesses it, but actively uh, champions it and lifts it. Uh, look at your value chain, what you can do, and participate in some of these gro um, global uh, programs that I talked about. Uh, that's why I'm very pleased that you have your women environmental, uh, sorry, women's uh, uh, network forum. Women's Environmental Network is equally important, by the way. But uh, Women Network Forum here, uh, and you're an important part of that mix. Um, for me, it's not just about empowering women and girls because it's the right thing to do, because it is, obviously. But for me, it's really a fundamental part of a world that is poverty-free, a world of inclusion, a world where everybody has the same rights to succeed. We were very fortunate being here in this room, to be born in the right part of the world. We were very fortunate to make it past the age of five, which is not the case for four million children every year who die unnecessarily of infectious diseases like pneumonia or diarrhea. We were very fortunate to have bathrooms at home and not worry about the issues of sanitation. We certainly got, a, got, got enough nutrition in the first thousand days that didn't scar our brains. We were very fortunate to go to school. In my case, the government who paid for education. And that's why we're fortunate to stand here. But if we belong to that part of the population, we frankly only belong to 2% of the population that can do and want what they will, or what they want, that can live where they want, have a comfortable life. My request is very simple, that if you belong to those 2% of the world population, it simply is your duty, it is your duty to put yourselves to the service of the other 98%. Thank you very much. It was a very impressive uh, speech, I must say, and it uh, confirmed what I also believe, is that if you like to see any change, it has to start from the top. It's about how, as leaders, we can set aspirational goals within our own businesses that can have dramatic effect uh, for all those who work for us and beyond. The phrase that will stick with me from today's event is we're not done and that's really really resonated with me so already my mind is working in terms of so you know what more can we be doing. Nobody doubts the direction and what we need to do overall but it's all about the speed and for me what's been most thought-provoking is asking myself are we doing enough and are we doing it fast enough?